Hello and welcome to Data Conversations Over Coffee with myself, Craig Stewart. It's fairly late in the evening. He has just gone eight o'clock. Uh, reason being is my guest, very special guest, George Furrican, uh, who's based in Vancouver in Canada, all the way on the West Coast, a good few thousands, if not tens of thousands of miles away from South Africa. George, how are you doing? Thanks so much for being on the show. Well, thank you so much for having me and staying up late. And uh, I know there are quite a few time zones between us for sure. It's uh, almost noon here, so it's quite a difference, time difference. But I yeah, appreciate absolutely. it. No, no worries. I think it's uh, one of the amazing things is that we can actually connect over so many time zones and then have these these conversations. And I've seen you've been doing a lot on on LinkedIn as well, um, keeping you relatively busy. I, I wanted to maybe ask: Is that um, something that you started? sort of, you know, at the beginning of lockdown as a sort of way of getting content out there, just something else to do? Or was it something that was kind of happening beforehand and just seemed to have taken off um, in this new digital environment that we live in? Yeah, it, it actually started before, I think about a year ago. So last year, I just started to be a bit more active on LinkedIn to get my voice out and uh, share the content that I was putting out on lightsondata.com. And uh, just to try and make uh, more data attainment, if you will, just try and make data management, data governance a bit more accessible to individuals, data professionals, and organizations as well, as I feel there's not enough of a, an uptake into those um, domains. So yeah, that was the goal. And then I think it kind of really hit further when the lockdown came to be and a lot more people starting to be online and, mm. and consume this content. Yeah, and I think it's so important and, and so great that you're focused on things like data governance and, and data management, kind of like Scott Taylor as well, because it often doesn't get the sort of airtime um, that it needs. It's something that I've tried to put a bit of focus on uh, with the podcast, really you know, a career in data management through the conferences that we do. I've always kept in you know, data governance, data management, data quality, because it is it's so critical. And we'll kind of get to that um, a little bit later on. So, so currently you're the director for data governance and BI at the University of, of British Columbia. Maybe you want to give us a little bit more insights into that role. I've come across some really great people um, over the years who, who work at universities in the data um, and analytics, space, but not from an academic point of view, from, from the corporate right. point of view, to actually help run the university. Maybe before we delve into the, the topic um, of the hour, dark data, you can give us a little bit of insight into your, your role at the university and also a bit on uh, lights on data. Sounds great, yeah. So I'm focused on the fundraising and alumni engagement arm of the university. So uh, we're trying to raise every year over $200 million to fund our research projects and programs, our you know, student awards, uh, different capital investments like you know, lab equipment and things like that. But it's really mainly to support research and to support students. And there's definitely quite a bit of money that people give away and we deeply appreciate it. So all of this really is also powered by data. We do have a lot of data on our constituents and our donors, alumni, and uh, things that would really support those two uh, domains. And uh, that's where I play that role of data governance to make sure that there is really clarity into what do we mean by an alum? What do we mean by a donor? And there's all different types of them and how do we consume this data from all the various uh, university databases but also external third-party databases that we integrate with in order to enrich our own data so there's definitely a lot of communication that needs to happen there both from a business perspective and a technical perspective and the bi side i'm also leading the uh, the business intelligence team as as well as our data analytics team so obviously there's a lot of reporting that needs to happen that provides us with the necessary hindsight and foresight to um, make better decisions. Okay, great. Good stuff. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, dark data. So you're speaking on two of my upcoming events being CDAO, CDAO Africa, which is in November, and Datacon uh, Middle East Live, which is in December, obviously both virtual events. Um, and you sent me a raft of topics, you know, areas that you could talk on. Um, and I chose you know, two for those conferences that I think are 
um, very practical and where the market um, sort of sits on the sort of information that, that, that they need in a practical environment. But I thought for, for this podcast, I think dark data is going to be really interesting. It's, it sounds like a mysterious topic, but when you sort of dig into it, I mean, dark data really, according to Gartner, is any data that's collected and stored but not really used. Um, by an organization and, and mostly it's for compliance purposes we just kind of collect it keep it store it uh, make sure that it's secure um, maybe you can give us your sort of insight introduction into dark data um, and then we can sort of delve into why companies aren't using it and, and what they can do to really unlock that value right and that, yeah you've you've nailed it i think that's the most common definition that gets cited the one from Gardner. And that's really what it is. Uh, and that's the most used one. There's another one which goes in a little bit more, um, cast a wider net, if you will, and we can go into that. But just to go into some examples of what dark data is, it's you know your log files, it's your tracking data, uh, surveillance footage, uh, all those emails that you're, you're still keeping from old employees, but you're not really using anymore, all the unstructured data, from let's say all your draft presentations uh, previous versions of documents and uh, you know intranet web pages that are not being used but only they're just being archived raw survey data that you've had but then you're just storing and not doing anything with them so it's things that you're keeping or you know just because we're we tend to be hoarders it's kind of like all your all your um, photographs on your phone especially now in the digital age, we can store so many things. And I know I'm you know, just looking at my phone right now. I'm, sometimes I'm taking um, you know, pocket photos when I put my <laughs> phone in. And just because storage is so cheap, I'm not mm. deleting them anymore. Or I'm, I'm taking burst photos by accident and yeah. I'm not deleting the 50 photos. I'm just keeping and not keeping the one. So it's all these things that you are having in your databases and your phones and your devices but really you're not using at all it's just there for multiple reasons the main one is because storage is cheap yeah right that's i think the main uh, the main piece it's also um the fact that we might have poor data quality on some of the data that we're collecting let's say some some of these surveys and we can't do much with it yet. We're hoping that we'll be able to cleanse that data before we could actually use it. But sometimes we never get around to it. So it kind of just stays there in the hope that at one point we'll be able to dedicate resource to it and do something mm -hmm. with it. Is it sort of, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, talking about the photos on the phone and, and this sort of dark data. Is it just the simple fact that people forget about it? Just forget that you've got it. It's not been cataloged properly. Uh, you know, people leave the organization and then you don't know that they had certain files or data, raw survey um, data from, from feedback that they've got from customers. So it's just basically, it's been forgotten. Is that as, as simple as it is for the most part? I think so. Yeah. Um, you know, f there was a survey from, I think, Jamalto, and they were saying that 46% of the executives that did answer the survey really believed that their companies don't know where all this data is being uh, stored in the first place. And some, and I forgot what the number was, but it was quite high, some of these executives didn't even know what what certain data they might collect. So they weren't quite sure that, yeah, maybe we do collect this, maybe we do not. And same with uh, some of their teams. And this tends to happen when you do have a siloed organization, when one department doesn't know what the other one is doing. Uh, and from, from their point of view, the other department is collecting all this dark data that they're not even aware of, that they could benefit from, but because there's not that communication between them, mm. then they're not sharing it and they're not using it for each other's purposes either. Yeah. So yes, I think a lot of times they might not even know that they're collecting certain things. Uh, and uh, most of the times, like you mentioned, they're kind of forgetting about it. Maybe 
you know, an old form, an old database that it's sort of archived from a system that's uh, no longer in use and it's been decommissioned, but it's still there just in case we ever need to query it. Mm. But the truth is it really becomes uh, more of a liability than an asset if it's not managed properly. Okay. I want to dig into that. It really in- lead towards that reputation loss. Yeah. yeah. All right, I want to dig into that a bit, but I think maybe one other thing I want to touch on, you know, one, maybe it gets forgotten, but is the other sort of side of that, you know, a lot of companies are driving sort of the improvement of data literacy across their organizations, not people who are just data professionals, but everyone across the organization having an understanding of what data is and how it can be used. Is a lot of this stuff maybe just not seen as data, you know, old emails, you know, maybe people just don't recognize that that is data. Um, or even, I mean, surveillance footage to a degree, but is it just maybe that people don't see it as data that they can use to understand the customer better or operations better? It's just a byproduct of business that's been stored somewhere. For sure, for sure. And I mean, you know, a a big part, a big chunk of this dark data really falls under that big data umbrella, that, uh, you know, unstructured data, like you mentioned. So, Yes, the, the yeah. emails, the uh, machine data, semi-structured data, unstructured data, all together, documents, mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. forth. And yes, you're right. I think that education plays a, a good role in it. And we're also constricted by the tools and technology that we have access to. And even if, you know, certain employees do understand the value, they might not have the, the skills nor the tools in order to mine that data, to perform text analytics, for example. So even if uh, they wanted to, they wouldn't be able to because they don't have the know-how or the resources. Mm. And I mean, I think everybody watching the show for the most part is a data analytics professional. So they'll understand if they can get their hands on this data, um, they can use it, they can augment the data that they currently got. Maybe they get a better view of of customer, a better view of what happened in in the operational side of the business. I guess for me then the question, is it hard to find? Is the discoverability of that data really difficult because it's been just locked away and no one knows perhaps where it is? Is that really the big challenge? We'll get into the risks and um, the liabilities around it later, but is it not being used just because it can't be found for the most part? It's almost like you don't know what you don't know. You don't know that you've even got this data, so therefore how can you use it? Yeah, that's definitely the hardest thing to find out (laughs) <laughs> what you don't know. Yeah. Um, so definitely uh, everybody's, any organization is encouraged to go through that exercise and try and catalog all their data and their data sources and really create a, a data inventory, if you will, with all the systems and uh, the different transactions that do happen. That's definitely ideal. And up until that point, all this knowledge is really held in isolation. And um and yes, and, and different things could just be missed, especially those that are archived for sure. So, but that's, that's, I think that's part of it. The other part of it is, is the fact that we do collect all this data that we're not using. So if we take a, a simple website that we're signing off for the Google Analytics product and it's tracking all this web analytics information, a lot of companies sign up for it because they understand the value. But they also, um, at least maybe in the beginning, they might lack the knowledge on how to use it. So some would would uh, start tracking and capturing this data, maybe even export it, hold it in their Excel file somewhere with the idea that at one point they will hire a specialist, a web analyst that could help them, um, you know, go into this data and get all that knowledge out of there. But it's just becoming so old that it's pointless to look at it ever again but it's still kind of kept somewhere just because. And the just because, again, it's because it's cheap. It's because they forget about it. It's because nobody wants to take the responsibility of removing something that, well, who knows if we ever do need it in the future. That was quite a good point that you brought up. There's kind of, you know, it's it's older data. At what point do you think it it sort of loses its, its value, its currency, because it is, you know, older survey data and, you know, especially web analytics, I mean, things happen so quickly. I mean, even customer transactions happen so quickly. Um, at what point does this dark data that's maybe been sitting you know, somewhere on archive for even a year, two years, 
just kind of lose its value and you kind of go well yeah unfortunately it was a an unused asset but we can't really do anything with it with it now yeah yeah i you know i don't think there's a general rule that it could apply to all dark data but it does help to put some sort of a dark data policy in place to understand whatever the retention rules should be. And mm. I think the steps that one should follow, like you said, first, you need to identify, you need to be aware that it exists, right? And the second step is to start to classify it. So to understand how do you wanna, you know, what, what sort of tags do you wanna add to it from a privacy perspective, from a regulation perspective, different other types of metadata that you could assign to it that it would allow you to segment it for different purposes. And um, definitely pulling this information into a searchable classification structure, I think is the first step to meet some regulations. So data classification has different other benefits than just for um, the dark data retention. Next step is to do that cost benefit analysis. And that's when you're going to understand and determine how long should you keep something or how long until it does become a liability, right? And then I guess you just gotta make uh, the business case of is it worth keeping it or not? And again, I think it depends on whatever and how it was classified in the first place. Mm. If it's something that uh, it's data that contains some regulated information, maybe you do need to keep it for you know seven plus years, depending again on the regulations, if it's PCI, if it's, uh, financial related, if it's, um, um, you know, I'm, I'm losing track of the GDPR. Yeah. Yeah. So depending on whatever the, the rules are from each one of these regulations, it could be that you need to store that data, even if it's not used, but you do need to store it because you need to comply with these regulation um, requirements. Yeah. So I think that's really the first step to take a look at it. And then anything that goes past it, and it's still not being used, then maybe you can have that retention policy or archival uh, destruction policy in place for it. Yeah. All right, cool. You've, you've touched on um, the risks and the liabilities um, quite a bit. Um, and, and maybe sort of some people will be saying, well, you know, old emails or, you know, old surveillance footage is maybe not really going to be much of a liability or risk. I get it if it's you know, credit or fraud data or customer data, things like that. Maybe explain a little bit more to the folks that are watching, um, you know, what do you mean by the liabilities and the risks associated with dark data? Yeah, and you know, even with emails, I mean, um, right, you could always get, uh, depending what type of an organization you are, but you can get what we call FOIPA requests, freedom of information uh, requests that anybody could, uh, well, at least for public organizations, that are able to, to ask for specific data on an individual. And that could include any emails that contain the name of that individual to see what have you talked about that person, that organization, whatever the project. So, you know, there could be a risk there. So you definitely, whatever you have in your chats, in your emails at work, it could always be um, even brought into a court of law if need be. So anything is, a certain liability per se but um you know back to to the cost and the risk there uh, there was this organization called veritas that was estimating um i think the global cost of dark data was expected this year to reach 3.1 trillion us dollars wow. which is definitely a lot of money yeah and uh and i think just just by storing non-critical information that you're not using. Um, I think back of that um, part of that same estimate, they were saying for, I believe it was mid-sized organizations that were holding maybe a thousand terabytes of data or so, it would cost them about half a million dollars a year just on storage costs mm -hmm. alone for something that you're just storing just because. So even if we take a look at that, and it, this was a few years ago, maybe five years ago, that this estimate was uh, put together. So the cost of storage definitely have decreased, but they're still there. So why, even from a from a storage perspective, why pay for something that you're not using? Yeah. Right. I in, again, I have an iPhone, and I have a limit on how much storage I have, and I'm like on their first plan, 
I don't want to pay more than uh, what was it, like a, a 99 cents a month. So that's kind of my retention policy. If anything goes, uh, if I'm getting that notification that I would have to pay more then I look at my old photographs and I start removing them. Mm. But, you know, and again, even beyond the actual cost of storage, it would just managing that dark data eats a lot of valuable resources. Yeah. And as I touched upon it before, everything is really vulnerable to legal discovery if any potential litigation emerges. So how much time and energy really would one need to spend to pull, you know, customer conversations out of storage? Yeah. It's definitely a lot. But yeah. if you don't need to have it or that part from 20 years ago, 10 years ago, then, then it kind of solves that, that issue. Yeah. And I, I guess the thing with, with organizational data and sort of the inflows and, and generation of data is it's kind of like a tap you can never turn off. Um, you know, this, this data is going to constantly be coming in. People are always going to be sending emails. You're not really going to turn your, uh, you know, your surveillance off. Uh, log files are always going to happen. Um, I suppose to a degree you could kind of rationalize and say, you know, I really need a good business case for a, a survey to collect raw data. Otherwise it's just going to sit. But you, know, how, like you talked about your dark data policy, but what can people do to maybe rationalize where they're getting data? Because one of the big challenges that we've found in surveys for companies really advancing their data analytics is access to large volumes of good quality data and obviously the good quality is the most critical part there but people want a lot of data they want loads of unstructured data to kind of go with your structured data are there areas that people can sort of look at and go yeah we actually don't need that data source we can turn it off if no one's using it um is, is that possible is that a, a thing that people can look at i guess it all depends on the industry and what those sources are um and there's definitely third party providers that you can purchase this data from and then you don't need to, to mm -hmm. retain it or even within the policy of uh, the vendor contract. If you terminate your, your um, business with them, then you do need to remove it from your systems. So I know, especially when it comes to data enrichment, uh, these things happen. So that's kind of helping with, with uh, not having dark data in the first place. But uh, yeah, I, th I think it all depends. And again, dark data is that data that we're just storing just because and we're not doing anything with it, not data that we would be, that we are using. Yeah, all right, cool. All right, so I thought maybe to close off um, and it kind of put it in your dark data policy. So I hope I'm not gonna ask you to repeat too much, but if you could give people three tips on how to uh, sort of manage and utilize uh, their dark data, what would that be? You know what, it's, it's, I think one of the, the first pieces that you should do is take a look at your competitors, see who is in your industry, who are your peers, and kind of see what things are they doing because part of that cost, again, of their data is that opportunity cost. So not doing anything with it, but looking at your competitors to see how are they utilizing this data yeah. that maybe you are also storing and then see what you're losing there, right? And how are they getting ahead because they are, they are doing it. And I do have, uh, and I cover examples in some of my presentations on this topic. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned is definitely make sure that you, you have a process to identify it. So start with that catalog, that inventory, then uh, classify, do that cost benefit analysis, make that your business case, uh, make sure that dark data is in your, regular disposition schedule and if you don't have one definitely put one together you need it for regular data too and then actually you know delete the data that you're you don't need and then just rinse and repeat i guess yeah clean up yeah all right great all right george thanks so much for the insight into dark data maybe uh what would be nice if you can tell uh people a little bit more about your podcast the the good data morning show um give that a bit of a plug um get people onto that yeah. as well yeah thank you so every every week on linkedin um i go on linkedin live on what's called the good data morning show and we have a special guest every time that we learn about different topics we've covered so far text analytics this week we're going to uh, go into data accessibility and data prioritization 
uh, we've covered you know how to do a data strategy for your organization we went into the cost of data quality and how you can do that so every week there's a bit of a different topic we have a different guest and Craig I hope we can have you on the show as well and uh, yeah just uh, join in follow me on LinkedIn and just join when it's live with your comments and questions and feedback and uh, we'll have a conversation in live. Yeah, absolutely. Um, everybody watching, definitely go and follow that. Maybe just based on that, you've had conversations with uh, loads of great people. Obviously, I follow you on, on LinkedIn as well. What, what are some of the trends that you're seeing in data analytics at the moment? And maybe we can kind of put that down to a bit of a micro timescale of the last um, six months, six to eight months of this um, rather insane year that we're having. Is there any sort of new trends that you're seeing in a, in a data environment? Well, sort of the, the machine learning AI is sort of the, the new sexy right now, I feel. Everybody's really trying to, to get a bit more and learn a bit more about it. And um, yeah, just I think another piece, and especially in the past few months, I feel the whole augmented reality and how data can feed into that and enhance our, our own um, you know, experiences from home or digitally mm -hmm to interact with a service, to interact with a product, have a new experience. I feel that's really emerging quite a bit. Um, yeah. Those are the two big things. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. George, thanks mm -hmm. so much. Um, have a great day over there in, in Vancouver. Uh, it's good to chat you and I look forward to seeing you on the events coming up. So everybody watching, if you um, want to hear more from, from George on, on building you know, data fundamentals into your data governance, um, catch him on CDAO Africa as well as Datacon uh, Middle East Live and I'll put the links into the uh, comment section. And if you've got any questions for George as well based on this video on dark data, either reach out to him on LinkedIn or put them in the comment section and I'll make sure to get them over to George. George, good to see you. Keep well. Likewise. Appreciate it.